Hey everybody, this is Autoblog Podcast producer Eric here. I'm just hopping in quickly at the beginning of the episode to let you know that this episode of the Autoblog Podcast is brought to you by the SoFi Daily Podcast. Reaching financial independence starts with having the right information. So every weekday morning, SoFi keeps you up to date with important business news and stock market happenings and how they affect your financial life. So get your money right and search for SoFi, that's S-O-F-I, wherever you get your podcasts. On with the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Autoblog Podcast. Joining me today on the phones is Senior Editor for All Things Green, John Snyder. What's going on, man? Hey, how's it going? It's going well. It's going well. And Mr. F-150 for the day, Associate Editor Byron Hurd. How's it going? It's it's a very truck day. I'm uh, I'm buried in trucks. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Uh, lots of big news, obviously. If you're listening to this Thursday night, you saw the Ford F-150 was revealed. We're going to break that down for you in its entirety. Uh, There's a lot to unpack there. Um, Some electrification news, which I think is kind of cool. And, uh, you know, again, like I said, there's a lot to unpack. Check out our site. We've got a lot of stories. Um, It's going to be interesting. It's been the best-selling truck, best-selling vehicle in the United States since the late 1970s. So I think one or two people are going to want to hear all about this. Uh, But if you don't, uh, we do talk about some other things. Byron spent some time in the Cadillac CT4V, uh, which is kind of neat. I drove the Toyota Prius, which was pretty, eh, okay. And John has spent some time in a 1960s microbus, which mm-hmm. just arrived uh, this week. And that's that's pretty awesome. And then, don't have to spend your money, but we do have a quick trivia section to close things out. We have a great show for you, but let's jump right in. Ford F-150. Byron, just real quick. Break it down like 30 seconds. What do you need to know about this truck right now? All right. So Ford's calling this all new and uh, it pretty much is. There's differences down to the frame length and track widths and everything like that. So it is a new truck. There's lots of new tech. There's a hybrid for the first time. And uh, the hybrid is going to have more horsepower and more torque than any other half ton in the segment. And so that means it's going to have more horsepower than the 6.2 liter Silverado, which makes 420. And it should have more torque than the uh, Eco Diesel Ram, which makes 480 pound feet. So those are your benchmarks for what Ford is claiming they're going to do with this. Um, The uh, new bed setup is pretty swank. There's some cool options, especially on the hybrid for plugging in lots of tools. So if you work your uh, truck on a job site and stuff like that. Uh, it's great for that. can also be used to recharge things like uh, electric off-road bikes or 4x4s, anything, any kind of toys, any kind of tools that you want to juice up while you're on the go. It'll have the capability to do that. And some nice interior upgrades, including Sync 4 and a new workspace in the center console, which actually folds down the gear selector so you can make yourself a little table. Uh, lots of great stuff. It looks like it's going to be a very interesting truck, both from an innovation perspective and from an individual productivity perspective. Nice. What's interesting to me is they are in fact calling this an all new generation and certainly an all new generation of F-150 is a big deal because it doesn't happen very often. Trucks tend to have a very long life and then sometimes automakers tend to kind of, uh, you know, play around the edges a little bit. It's like they'll call it a new generation, but it isn't exactly. But this, this sounds legit. You know, you're talking about different dimensions and then a lot of additional features, tech, things that make this um, new, better, different, and it sounds like more competitive. So yeah, cur- it looks... Go ahead, Byron. I'll let John take it, actually. Well, I was just going to say, I, it's really interesting just how many, how feature-rich uh, this truck is becoming. Uh, trucks have, you know, uh, the, the big three have been making these trucks with more and more just stuff in them. Uh, over time, and this um, this one is heavily tilted toward um, a work uh, truck. I mean, there's a lot the, the workspaces, the plugs. Uh, I'm just curious how, how pricey this is going to get uh, when you start adding those things on. But um, you know, trucks can get 
pretty crazy when you start adding on all the different features and checking boxes. Um, and, <laughs> and that's one thing about trucks is they're sort of becoming less and less attainable. Um, so I'm, I'm going to be curious to see how this all uh, measures out with in terms of pricing, but it's just interesting to see just, you know, that, that fold down, uh, gear selector with a little table that pops out is, is really, really interesting. Um, and then some of the other, you know, work features, the, the plugs, and then there's some stuff going on with the tailgate too. Uh, it's, it's really interesting what they're doing with it. So one of the reasons we have John on this podcast is we knew there would be a form of electrification for the F-150. Uh, Byron, why don't you just tell us what we know about this? And then John, you jump in and tell me your take. Is this What's this going to do for the F-150's green credentials? Go ahead, Byron. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this is a, I mean, it's a full-blown hybrid. Uh, it's, uh, the specs on it are still kind of hazy, um, but we do know it's going to be offered on at least most of the higher trims. They're now calling it, uh, well, they're calling it Power Boost. And it's an interesting choice since the uh, Echo Boost or Eco Boost, depending on what part of the world you live in, moniker was already taken, and it seems like that would make the most sense for a hybrid. But it does make a lot of power, as we covered earlier, so I guess it's, it's an appropriate way for them to go about it. Um, but they've got the uh, battery pack mounted underneath the bed, it appears from the diagram I'm looking at. And it's paired to a 3.5 liter EcoBoost V6, so the EcoBoost still exists within this formula. So the EcoBoost made up to, I believe it's 450 horsepower in the Raptor and in some versions of the Limited. So they've got a really stout engine on which to build this whole hybrid system around. And they're taking advantage of it for the in-bed charging because the, the generator, which is effectively what the the option is the generator is available on the gas engines but it has higher output on the hybrid so you go from two kilowatts i believe it is in the basic uh version on the gas engines to 2.4 in a entry level hybrid and then up to 7.2 so 7200 watts of available power in the optional version on the hybrid models which is where you get the ability to basically power an entire backyard theater system out of the back of your truck if you want to. So it's versatile, it's powerful, um, and it remains to be seen really what the cost is going to be. The version they showcased it on at the reveal was a limited model, which is already a very expensive truck before you even start throwing any options at it. So I imagine that limited plus power boost plus the optional upgraded generator to make everything you can come out of that hybrid system is going to be astronomically expensive might be the words we want for it, but it still seems pretty compelling and interesting, especially since this is the first time someone's done a really fully fleshed out hybrid half ton pickup. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a trend I've seen lately, especially over at Ford. Um, you know, the, the hybrid isn't, isn't about fuel economy. It's just about, about power. Um, and hence calling it power boost but yeah you know you look at the the lincoln uh aviator the and the plug-in hybrid is is not you know it's the it's the performance version right um this uh in the f-150 the hybrid uh allows you know for that extra power um as well as you know more of those work features um so yeah i i think it's totally fine to call it power boost and not eco boost because it's not really an eco play it's it's a power play it makes sense too for like just having like appealing to that i'd say like you know truck buyer that's all about the capability you know there always was that concern hey if you do drop down to a v6 or some other type of propulsion you know for a long time it was anything but a v8 it seemed like you know just blasphemy it was totally unacceptable so I understand why they're trying to sort of, you know, choose their words carefully, choose their naming carefully, but I don't know. I would totally buy a green pickup truck right now. So I, you know, I don't know. The power boost thing, I could, I could go back and forth on that. There's a lot going on in the naming department with Ford right now. <laughs> Mach 1, Mach E, Bronco, Bronco Sport, uh, all sorts of things. I guess Maverick is off the table, but so it goes. What else about this truck? What else should we know? Well, I've, 
just sticking with the hybrid for a second, it's, I think, encouraging that they're using a lot of components that have already been proven over the last generation or two of the F-150. Um, this uses the 10-speed transmission with recalibration and some new hardware to make it hybrid-friendly. And uh, the 3.5-liter EcoBoost V6, which I already mentioned. But a lot of this, the tech in here is actually fairly conventional, and I think there's a reason they decided to launch with this instead of a full plug-in or a full electric just because this kind of lets them dip their toe in the water a little bit, prove to their buyers that they're building a truck first and a hybrid second, if that makes sense. And also just demonstrate that it's capable and reliable and that it can get the job done, which is kind of like their, you know, their big thing with this. Everything is, is work focused. So, um, but yeah, beyond that, I mean, most of the rest of the stuff with the truck, the powertrains largely carry over with the exception of the new hybrid we don't know whether there's going to be, I mean, we do know there's going to be a Raptor. We just don't know what it's going to look like yet, especially uh, since we got a teaser yesterday that the Rebel TRX from Ram is going to be formally introduced this summer. So we're getting, you know, the, the pickup wars are, are kind of going to the next level. Um, so we don't know what's what the fate of the higher output 3.5 liter EcoBoost from the last generation truck will be, whether it will go out in favor of perhaps a boosted V8 because Ford's got that GT500, right? So there could be lots of interesting things to come out of this. Um, what, we're, what we've seen this week is just kind of the foundation. And we've got you know a Raptor coming down the pipeline probably. We've got an electric truck coming down the pipeline probably. And there's no reason not to do a plug-in hybrid eventually, probably, especially because they already have that with the Lincolns. So uh -huh. there's... There's a lot of potential here. This is this is the canvas, and we'll see what they paint. Wow, well said. Okay, <laughs> that's very eloquent. This is gonna be a this is gonna be a fun one to to write the buying guides for. <laughs> oh, eventually, man. you know, there's just it's gonna be you know so many different configurations. <laughs> yeah, six engines, and then so many cab styles and bed lengths, and you name it. It just it's all over. I think what's interesting about the F one fifty is how. They really try to like I'd say meet the like the customer and Ford is you know obviously an expert at the F one fifty customer you know meet him or her right where they're at you know there's so many different flavors of it so many different um, you know ways you could outfit it I think it's a legit luxury vehicle you know and it's top trims oh yeah um, so yeah I mean this is another one that I'm gonna be very excited to drive I'm always with vehicles like the F-150 and the Silverado and the Ram and just other things too, you know, maybe some traditional like the Tahoe or the Yukon um, where like the recipe is sort of there. I like to sort of try like the, the new, the flashy things. So I'm super intrigued by the hybrid. Um, yeah. I mean, we'll just, you know, I can't wait to play around with some of those features in the, you know, the bed. That'll be fun. Um, just it's, it's cool. I mean, I think, you know, we'll see. On paper and, you know, what we saw at the reveal, this looks like very strong foot forward for Ford. It looks like they put all their cards down. There's still some room to play and that they're going to be able to maintain sort of the sales volume that they've come to expect and frankly depend on to stay viable as an automaker. What the biggest concern I think you would have if you're Ford going into this is that you sort of stub your toe like Ford Chevy did with the last generation of the Silverado, where, you know, Ram's uh, sales sort of went up. There was actually a few months there where Ram, like, slipped ahead of Silverado in the sales order, which was, you know, frankly, it happens, but it's not a common thing. And I think what a lot of people thought, especially truck enthusiasts, was that the Ram was demonstrably better than the Silverado. When they did that update, the interior wasn't quite where it needed to be. The, you know, there was nothing really compelling about the powertrains. The exterior was polarizing. A lot of us saw it and I kind of liked it, but I, a lot of people didn't. It was very polarizing. So, and, you know, this has been three, four years. It's been a work in progress. All this is to say that it took Chevy a while to get it right. That if they had just done it the first time, they would have saved themselves a lot of, you know, heartache, headaches, all those things. To me, on paper, it kind of looks like Ford is going to get this generation of the F-150 right out of the gate. Curious what you guys think after my little mini monologue there. Well, I, I think so too. Um, I, 
I, I'm a little disappointed that we, we have to wait longer for the, you know, uh, for the plugin versions. Um, but I see what Byron was saying about, um, you know, showing them that this is, that they can do this truck right. Uh, the the whole hybrid being uh, a power play, you know, you know, it's, it's introducing people to, to uh, electrification in a truck and, and, and showing that it's not some, you know, rinky dink feature that's, you know, it's, it's not going to be a Prius. It's not going to be, you know, it's still going to be your, your uh, big, tough Ford. Um, and, and, and sort of priming the pump for, for the future electric versions. Uh, I, I, I think they're, they could be selling themselves a little short by not, uh, it depends on how how quickly they get those out, because then, like we saw, the Lordstown is is <laughs> building its truck, and and I think the Cybertruck buyer is going to be a completely di- different type of buyer. But you know, there, there are these other um, pickups that are coming out, G- GMC with the Hummer. You know, uh, I hope Ford can get the ball rolling with with the electrics quickly enough that um, you know they're not sort of left in the dust. But that but they are starting with this good format, this, this new truck where they thought of everything. Um, so I think, I think it's a, I think it's a good play. Cool. Yeah, I agree. And on top of that too, it's, it's, we're reaching a point, I think with half ton pickups where capability is, it's still important. Obviously it's core to what trucks do and, and what a lot of buyers want, but they're starting to find new ways to make trucks more than just about, a stout engine and a strong transmission and a, you know, a good rear end and the suspension you need to carry it all. It's, you know, we don't, we don't need half ton pickups that tow 15,000 pounds and we're rapidly approaching that territory. But what the automakers are now starting to do, which we saw with GMC and the multi pro tailgate. And now with all these workspace improvements that we're getting with the new F-150 that they're trying to find ways to make the trucks more versatile give them little like killer app style features. I'm doing that with air quotes that you guys can't see, but the idea being that, you know, okay, it's a truck. It can do the basic truck things, but it can also be your mobile office and be comfortable and be a family hauler and do that. And that's kind of where everyone's branching out. And it's interesting to see the half tons leapfrog each other because GM went with multi pro. And now we have this work surface and plug-in theme with the F-150 and so with Ram just having leapfrogged GM in so many ways with the last 1500, the ball is now kind of back in their court already. It's, it's amazing how quickly these guys are kind of obsoleting each other with these little features that don't necessarily make them better fundamental trucks, but they do make them more useful and practical in ways that, you know, 20 years ago, we never would have even considered. So it's, it's impressive to watch and it's going to be interesting to see how buyers respond to these features and whether they get iterated on and improved on future models or if they go by the wayside. Ford Ford's really on a roll right now when you think about it with the products they're they're coming out with um with this F150 and then you know the Mach-E's coming out and and then the Bronco <laughs> it's it's kind of exciting just to just to see it all. Uh, and that's that's a lot to live up to for the for the other Detroit automakers. Yeah, thumbs up or thumbs down as far as the design. Thumbs up. It's safe. <laughs> you know, it, it, there's nothing you know ob- objectionable about it. Yeah, that's my that's my instinct too. I honestly, I think one of the things that made the Ram design so good was that they didn't try to do anything too wildly different. And I think Ford took that same approach. GM did it with their interior to their detriment, but for the exteriors, I think it made a lot more sense. And I'm I'm kind of in the the same uh, boat as Greg when it comes to the styling of the GM pickups. I actually genuinely like the way this the GMC Sierra looks, and I'm kind of lukewarm mm-hmm. on Silverado. It's fine. Uh, it grew on me a little bit, but it's never going to be the point where I'm like, oh yeah, that's a great looking truck. But I actually genuinely do feel that the Sierra is an attractive pickup. Yeah, I'd agree with that totally. I think um, I think I like the Chevy a little bit more than you do, just because I think in Trail Boss trim it looks pretty awesome. Um, but yeah, this is super conservative. Like even from the side, I would do a double take. Like, is this even new? But they did enough up right. front to the grill. Like 
those headlights that we've seen on some of the Ford SUVs, you can sort of see that like the same concept apply there. Um, yeah, I mean, it looks pretty good. It looks like an F-150. I mean, that's, that's all you have to do. I mean, mm -hmm. essentially yep. since that, you know, going back probably 15 years ish, that was the last like really dramatic, you know, departure for like an F-150 where it was like borderline curvy, if you will. Since then they've played it really like really, really square quite literally. So, so yeah, that's the F-150. Um, check out the full story. Full stories, some great videos by Alex Malberg and uh, Amr Sayur. They, you know, cut those together. They look great. Check those out on the site. Tons of galleries, tons of pictures. We hope you enjoyed the live stream that you could watch on Autoblog. Um, and that's still up there. If you want to go back, if you're listening to this on Saturday, maybe you're out walking the dog in the park like I often do, and you hear some stuff, you're like, oh, hey, I need to get back. I got to check that out. I got to read more on that. So please do. Uh, but let's move along to some of the cars we've been actually driving. Uh, this is a Byron heavy uh, show here. You spent some time in the Cadillac CT4V. This was maybe three weeks ago ish. Tell me what this car is like. And another thing, and I mean, frankly, I'm the editor of a car website and I mix up Cadillac's lineup. Why don't you just tell everybody out there what the heck a CT4 is? and where it fits, and then what the V actually means right now. Sure. So CT4 is going up against the Audi A3, the uh, BMW 228i Grand Coupe, well, the whole the whole 2 Series Grand Coupe lineup, um, and the uh, Mercedes A-Class. The idea is to have this, this small sedan that kind of slots in where compact sedans used to be. We're calling them subcompact, even though that's probably pushing the definition a bit. But that's the, the space in which it plays. And the V models now are the mid-grade performance models. So the idea is that you're stepping up from the base engine to a more powerful one. Uh, you're getting some other performance upgrades and things like that. So think Audi S3, BMW M235i, and the Mercedes uh, AMG variants. They have a 35 and a 45, I believe. So this would be geared more toward the 35. So the idea with this is... You get a mechanical limited slip differential. You get performance dampers with the uh, Magna Ride fourth generation magnetic ride control, and some other little bits and pieces like that. You get a little extra power. It's like ten or fifteen horsepower more than you get on the premium luxury variant. But it's supposed to be sporty enough to feel fun for a small luxury car without being a full blown performance model. And V used to be full blown performance. Yeah. in many ways literally blown because they were supercharged like that was the idea it was just like big honking horsepower numbers in competent chassis i mean they gm's been making great rear wheel drive platforms for a while now we shouldn't discount that that the fact that this new one is very good isn't actually all that new um but the uh the new range topping cars will be called blackwing which of course shares a name with a now stillborn turbocharged v8 that GM produced for the CT6V that was supposed to go on to be featured in other models and it's now discontinued, but at least the name is going to live on. And those are going to be the ones that have the biggest engines possible, the most performance possible. They're going to be the ones running around the Nürburgring and all that kind of stuff and probably setting lap records and everything that GM loves to do. And I believe the, the current theory, which I don't think has actually been confirmed by GM, but the idea is that the CT4V Blackwing model will have a six-cylinder in it, which the CT4V does not. It has the large 2.7 liter four that's also in the GM trucks. And it's a great engine. It's torquey. It's powerful. It, it feels great to drive. Uh, it does the job, but I'm interested to see what they do with that twin turbo six. So the, uh, the CT4V, though, I, I came away very impressed. You get a little more car for the money than you do from the Germans. Uh, it's plenty fast. It's plenty comfortable. The magnetic ride control is wonderful, as it pretty much always is. I've never had an impl implementation of that that I wasn't impressed with. Um, it's got a, a great ride anywhere from the freeway to the back roads. You dial it in a little bit. It has a V-mode button right on the steering wheel. If you want it to go like straight to sporty, just click that. Dials everything up to 11, and you go. Uh, it's a really impressive little car. It's It's one of the few... GM models, and especially one of the few Cadillac models that I have driven lately where when I say something like, it's a great little car, 
I don't have to say but and then add some sort of caveat to the end of it. It's it's <laughs> just a great little car. I had a I had a blast driving it. It was very comfortable. All the tech worked. Fit and finish was great. The interior actually genuinely impressed me, which is something again I haven't said about many Cadillacs lately. Uh, I was pretty much blown away by that little car. It was I was very impressed. I actually really enjoy how the just sort of this new generation of Cadillacs looks. I think it harks back a little bit to the almost like the '60s, right after Cadillac got out of the like the really you know over the top like '50s, and they created stuff that was still good looking, still stylish, but a little more toned down. And when I look at the CT4, the CT4V, that's what I see. I sort of like, you know, I mean, frankly, in general, I like 60s cars more than 50s cars. Um, but I think, you know, I just, I feel like that sort of, you know, understated elegance, but performance is, is really showing up in Cadillacs. So yeah, I mean, just, I did drive this car, but you know, looking at the pictures, it looks great. Not sure how I feel about Cadillac's whole just lineup, total like, you know, just tweak. It's, I think it's a little confusing, even the way they're, you know, recasting the V. Um, we'll see. Uh, I will say this my guess is you would concur. Cadillac and General Motors chassis have been really good lately. They've been really dialing in Cadillacs, especially, and like the Camaro. So, I mean, I think. This is a good car for enthusiasts. Uh, I kind of wonder, you know, the A3 segment. Um, I don't know, man. It's it's a good spot for Cadillac to go to try to win. I think they probably have the products to win. The question is, is are, you get, are you going to get anybody out of their said A3? Or are you going to get out of the A-class to get into, you know, a CT4? I don't know. I mean, maybe you will. Uh, we'll see. I think if you... I mean, the trick is, is it's just, it's quite literally a small segment. The cars are small, the market's small, the opportunity's small. So it's like, you yep. can do something amazing there, but at the end of the day, oh, will okay, anybody notice? where's your midsize crossover coupe, you know? Um, but it sounds like a good car. Yeah. And I also, I forgot to mention this before talking about the black wings. Those models will get manual transmissions. GM has already nice. confirmed that officially. That's not just a rumor that is going to happen they're going to be limited production but they will be offered with a manual so for the enthusiasts who really have to have it all black wings coming yeah i was i was a little uh sad to see the the v uh brand if you will get sort of diluted um uh, but i i think what they're doing with the black wing more than makes up for that yeah. that's gonna be a, that's gonna be awesome i'm right there with you on that cool I think uh, I think that's enough on the on the Cadillac, if you will. Uh, I spent some time this week on the new Toyota Prius. It's quite nice. I found it to be a little. I'm curious what you think, John. Too. I found it to be a little boring. Um, I mean, yeah, it's a Prius, <laughs> so I mean, stunner. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> but um, you know, I don't. Know. I think they took a risk with the design. They kind of took it away from the you know the very like you know. Um, I don't know, beige ish sort of look of the, you know, the previous Prius and made it look a little bit more like, uh, you know, a little more cartoonish even, you know, there's a lot of creases. If you look hard, the back end mm -hmm. almost looks like it has fins. If you really want to see that speaking of things from the fifties, um, you know, there's a little bit of, you know, the hybrid stuff, I think makes it fun to drive in a little bit of a sense, you know, cause there's a little bit of that electric boost under some circumstances. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it was fine. It was a Prius. I got some takeout in it. Uh, they dropped it right in the back of the hatch. So, Hey, I mean, that's kind of the way we live right now. I mean, I don't know. It was the Prius. I feel like you got to sort of turn it into a game to make it entertaining. Um, and they, they do, you know, Prius has always had sort of gamification techniques. Like it used to have, the little leaves that would grow the the more efficiently you drove. But um, I think that that's kind of how you have to approach it to have fun with it. And it, it can be fun, you know, just trying to get the ultimate mileage out of it that you can. Um, yeah. I, I like the Prius. Uh, it's, it's not the most exciting car in the world, but it's, it's popular for a reason. It's, I, I feel like, well built 
um, the mileage is really excellent. Um, and they've been making it for a long time and they, they know what their customers want and they keep delivering that. Um, I would like to see, uh, a big, at least visual redesign. Um, but probably not going to, not going to get that anytime soon. I don't think the looks of this current Prius, I think are a little far off. It's hard. It's hard to look at. (laughs) Um, yeah, I, I've never been a big fan of, of the way it looks. Um, but I mean, I, I can kind of look past that just because it's, it's really good at, at what it, what it does being an efficient, affordable hybrid. In the numbers you mentioned earlier, just to be specific here, 48 highway, 52 city, 50 combined. I mean, that's outstanding. This car costs just yeah. under 32 grand. Um, I mean, that's that's like real world stuff that makes your life better, if you will. Um, yeah. And now now they have the, the all-wheel drive version too. It's it's um, you know, something for for everyone. I, you know, I... I know lots of people who you know just won't buy anything that doesn't have all wheel drive. Um, it just, <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I tell them snow tires are fine, but, but it's, it's a mindset and, and it, it, it's, it adds confidence. Just the seeing that all wheel drive badge on the back gives, gives people a little more confidence in their vehicle. Um, and I, I drove this thing in this, in the snow and it was actually pretty great in the snow it it handled the snow remarkably well um <laughs> pretty deep stuff it just sort of pushed its way right through it and you know it was it was pretty stable going through corners not a lot of slippage not a lot of understeer so i it was it did what it's supposed to and and i think that's why why people like it in general it just it works as advertised yeah, the one I tested was XLE all-wheel drive E hybrid. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I would probably get the hybrid, uh, excuse me, the all-wheel drive, you know, just if I yeah. were, you know, where we all live, it's it's cold and snowy. And, I mean, it's, I think, an assurance. And, you know, I know you mentioned it's pretty capable there, John. One thing I find interesting, though, is a car this, like, small and low, like, you know, you're you're gonna have some trouble getting through some snow if you know you encounter it. Like, yeah. there's not really any ground clearance. So, yeah, um, you know, it is what it is. But yeah, I think um, it's the Prius. Like, I drove it, and I was like, I was actually really excited to drive it because I have not driven um, the Prius in quite some time. And I feel like as an automotive mm-hmm. journalist, you got to get into some of these like you know major cars. Um, so yeah um it's smooth it's comfortable it's quiet um it's it's serene um you know if you're not looking for excitement it's a it's a really nice really nice car to drive cool cool well i think that's we'll leave the prius there i think we've uh it's about as much as anybody needs to know uh (laughs) yeah i mean pizza fit back there very well though when i got that on friday (laughs) much better than when i put it in the back of a land cruiser with those touchy brakes and um (laughs) Oh yeah. You know, oh, <laughs> yeah, it was actually surprisingly <laughs> fine, but I don't know how, um, but the Prius, <laughs> Hey, it's just a little smaller of a space. fits pretty well. So let's move on to a far more interesting car, a 1967 VW micro bus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They dropped it off in my driveway today. It's, it's beautiful. It's the, it's the 21 window Samba. Um, so it's <laughs> it's long. It's got a bunch of weird little quirks to it. Um, it's this beautiful uh, white on orange, um, and it's just a wonderful, wonderful vehicle. I I drove it around a little bit. Um, I'm gonna take it out for a, a longer drive tonight and get some photos of it. But um, it's. You know, it's not fast <laughs> at all. I think uh, it's a one one point five liter, uh, making a whopping uh, fifty four horsepower, I believe. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but it's it's just fun. It is. It's you know, it's beautiful inside and out. Uh, just 
really interesting design. Um, I love the, the the windshield. It's like that split windshield. Um, I think 67 was the last year that they had the split uh, two-piece windshield, but the, the windshield pieces uh, prop up. You can open them and <laughs> get the air in your face, which is good because this thing doesn't have AC. It has this little lip over over the top of the windshield with some vents under it, like a sort of a, a roof scoop sort of thing that, that fill, p- pushes air into the cabin and you can, there's a little flange where you can direct it, you know, onto yourself or back toward the, the passengers in the rear. Um, a lot of little quirks about it. It's got this uh, big sunroof that opens up, but I'm not, I don't think I'm going to touch that because I don't want to break it. <laughs> Um, but the car, you know, I was warned is, is not watertight, <laughs> oh boy. uh, which is fine. Cause we have good weather right now, but, um, you know, little four speed got a reverse. It's really, really tricky to find. Um, and it, it, it turns heads around the neighborhood too. It's just, it, it's beautiful. It's in really nice condition. Uh, and these, these air cooled. VWs are just a joy. You know, I've my buddy Luke that I grew up with in Oregon, he, you know, has owned several uh Beatles and I, I've sort of I fell in love with those. Um this is my first time driving the microbus. Uh and it's it's really nice. I I'd be afraid to take it on a long trip. I know a lot of things can go wrong with them <laughs> and you know it's exceedingly slow too <laughs> so i don't i don't even know if i'd want to take it on the highway here where the speed limit is 70 because i think this thing maxes out at 65 <laughs> but it's a it's a joy even at those low speeds it's it's wonderful very cool uh i think uh we've had a lot of pretty interesting old school volkswagen vehicles coming through our press fleet uh-huh. um this is, I think, a little bit to do with just the pandemic, like trips are not really happening and Volkswagen has reached out and, you know, there's a Carmen Ghia, we have an old GTI, we have the Microbus, uh, I think Joel got to drive an old Beetle, so just lots of yeah. cool things that we're getting to try and it's it's fun. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I've wanted to buy a, a, a classic Beetle for for years and years and years and there's you know one or two that i came close to but after driving this i i really want one (laughs) i i'm ready to go out and and spend a few grand to get a get a classic beetle that maybe isn't in in the best of shape and and uh you know my my son is interested in cars and that'd be a fun one you know simple enough one to work on too um but i I'm, i'm ready this it's just so so much character, so so much character and so much history too. It's just a wonderful, wonderful vehicle. Yeah, I um, I don't share your passion for the Beetle, or really, I think I'm like kind of a the grouchy auto blog guy who just is not really into the Beetle. I know Joel loves it. <laughs> I actually went to the launch of it back in twelve or thirteen when they revealed it at the New York Auto Show. Um, I mean, I I like for what it is, but I mean, just. Throughout the generations, it's never really done much for me. If I was going to get a classic car, I don't think I'd get a Beetle. I mean, that's fine. I'm glad other people <laughs> like like it. But the van, I 100% think that is sweet. I could get on board with that. I could have fun. Um, I Like you, I don't think I'd want to drive it very far, but it'd be a fun tailgate kind of thing or, oh, you yeah. know, I don't know. I mean, tailgate close, but, you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> Yeah, and it's got you know three three bench rows, so you can fit a lot of people in there. Oh, um, God, <laughs> so slow. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, and there's just lap belts. There's nothing really keeping you from <laughs> getting hurt if you if you get in an accident. But that's the risk you take with these old cars. Yeah, yeah, it's um, I don't know. Old cars are fun. I don't know how to work on them. That's what's basically stopping me from, you know, buying something that I, you know, that would require some like actual work. Cause I'd love an old alpha. I'd love an old, 
I have this weird thing where I'd like an old Chevy Nova, but um, I'm like the only person who probably would be into that. An old Ford Falcon from the early 60s. But again, if you can't oh, do yeah. the work, what do you, you know, what are you going to do? You know, you're just going to basically have this monument in your garage that's not really doing anything. And I actually have several of those cars right now in my life that I need to dispose of, uh, including my personal car <laughs> and 06 Charger. And my parents still have a 73 Chevelle I need to unload. So, um, and the Charger is in okay shape. The Chevelle is fine. It just, you know, it's, it needs to be restored. And when you're in that kind of like gray area of what do you do with it? You know, it's uh, tough. So I digress. Somehow yeah. we went from sixties Volkswagen vans to 73 Chevelles. Should we do some <laughs> trivia? Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. That is, um, I want to make that sigh. Like, like my email notification, like, <laughs> like when somebody or when somebody slacks you, you get like Snyder, like sighing and kind of lightly growling. Um, all right. So I came up with this segment. We tried it out about a month ago with uh, just a few trivia questions. And I tried it mm -hmm. out with you two. Cause you seem like, you know, you guys have been around a little while, you know, know a thing or two, you know, a little bit about trivia. And then I just haven't had a chance to do it again. And lo and behold, mm -hmm. who's on the podcast, Let's do some trivia again. And um, All right. you guys are like, yeah, could you do this when anybody else is on the show but me? But <laughs> it's all right. I just, I, I, my, my brain works in weird ways. But uh, all right. Well, sometimes I, sometimes I get them. Every once in a while, okay. I can get a trivia question. Right, well, <laughs> this is fairly easy, um, I think. So let's, let's give it a go. All right. And also, uh, one thing the um, like podcast listeners told us last time is try not to spend too much time thinking about it. So it's all right. <laughs> think about it. But, you either know it or you don't. Yeah, Spin apparently the awkward <laughs> pauses were not well received. I mean, <laughs> so it goes. I don't know. All right. Keep it simple. What British car company was featured over a couple of seasons in the 1960s AMC drama Mad Men? Byron. Oh, I haven't seen it. Uh, Byron, have you? Yeah, that, uh, that should be Jaguar, I believe. I All have right. seen that. That's a win for Byron, and John just punts. So there we go. Score is <laughs> one, one to nothing. All right. Now, this is actually multiple answers are acceptable here. How did Chevy's okay. bow tie originate? We'll start oh. with you, John. Ooh. I, I honestly don't know. I feel like I've heard the story before, but... but uh, if there's an answer, if there's a correct answer, I don't recall it. And I, 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 I remember hearing about it at one point, and, but I've forgotten. <laughs> no, I think the only GM logo story that I know well was the whole, you can't sell an American flag on a car. And so the Corvette ended up with the other stuff instead. Um, <laughs> that's the, that's the only GM story I can think of off the top of my head for, for logos and badges. We'll keep it simple. Billy Durant is said to have seen it on wallpaper in a Paris hotel in 1908. That's sort of like the official answer, but even, uh. even GM sort of admits that may or may not be true. Hmm. Okay. So, and they have multiple alternate theories. Um, maybe when we post this, put this in the podcast post, I know everybody's probably listening to this on your phone, but if you care that much, Check out over to Autoblog and we'll post these questions with the answers. And there's a link to this press site. And it's funny because normally car companies are very like, this is the press release. This is the statement. This one's like, ah, yeah. well, we think it could have been this. It was probably this Paris <laughs> hotel room story, but it also is like, you know, these other things that it could be. So uh, I guess we'll keep the score at one, nothing Byron, uh, which technically yep. gives John a chance to pull into a tie here on question number three. The Buick okay. Riviera was originally supposed to be what? I'm looking for a brand here. Uh, a brand? Yeah. Buick Riviera? Yeah, think about GM in the 60s. This car was designed, and it wasn't actually supposed to be a Buick, if that makes sense. Think GM and all the brands they had back then. What was it uh, actually supposed to be? Or could have been? I'm not sure it was supposed to be, but could have been. Pontiac? Good guess. Byron? Uh, I'm going to say Oldsmobile, just because it's not one of those. You're both wrong. Cadillac. 
Oh, ah, okay. That was my first. Gut if you look at instinct. it, it almost looks like a '60s Cadillac, especially the earlier ones. Just the way the headlight and the grill kind of stack okay. up. Um, yeah, it's okay. Uh, I was thinking. I was thinking that until you started reminding me that there was, you know, all those other those other brands back then, and then I was like, I have to go with one of the orphan brands. Those are good questions, Greg. I really like. I really like this. We're just gonna do three this time. Last time we did five. We got a little, you know, just a little, little in bit, the weeds. <laughs> little in the weeds. Yeah, it got a little whatever. But no, these these were great great questions. This I yeah, will, this is good. I will call up this Wikipedia page here. But I've heard this before. Believe me, I don't just do this all on Wikipedia. But apparently, this was like an experimental design, and this is straight from Wikipedia at this point called the EXP seven one five. And it was going to be called a LaSalle or something. Um, yeah, apparently Cadillac, this goes to like, and this is more like general history. I have heard this. Cadillac was just like, yeah, no, we don't want this. You know, back when the company was like GM was at the height of its powers and Pontiac, Oles, Chevy, uh, the trucks division. They were all like their individual companies within the company. And they could be like, no, we don't want this. And then yeah. Buick's like, well, wait a minute here. We we could use this, and away we go. Hmm. Yeah, that was back when there was a lot of competition between the, the GM brands. They used to fight over engines, like different V8 oh, yeah. engines and things. So, Oh, yeah. They, <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was sometimes a bitter rivalry, but uh, it made for great cars. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great example of competition being better, if you will. Um, yes. Yeah. All right. Uh, how are you guys doing? How's your life? We have a couple extra minutes here. Everybody, I'd say quarantine is somewhat over. There's no quarantine recipes to share. Are you guys venturing out much <laughs> before the second wave of coronavirus maybe hits? I don't know. Um, I've been going up north. Uh, it, I've, I've taken the the uh, outback, or I mean. Uh, Forester, our long-term forester up north a couple times recently, um, but it's it's just really nice to to go up to the to the lake. Um, oh man, like my my almost five year old son was was going crazy. I feel like <laughs> during during quarantine, and then you know he misses people, but when he's up there, you know the he he sees you know the neighbors he knows and stuff and. Um, you know, just plays in the water and uh, everyone's mood and behavior just gets way better <laughs> instantly. Um, but I've, I've been really enjoying that those long drives because, uh, you know, I, I, I used to commute into the office every day and, and, uh, you know, that, that drive time was, you know, time for checking out the cars and time for reflection. Um, and, and I get to do that on that drive. And plus, I got, I got to uh, take the I took the outback out on some some trails to go to the uh, some state land where I go shooting. So I you know it was sort of uh, on these sand trails. Put it in the X mode with the with the dirt and mud. So I tested that out. Nice. And it was pretty cool. Byron, what's new in your life? I've been pretty much doing the same kind of stuff. Um been trying to get out on the weekends and just kind of drive around. I mean, I'm new to Michigan, so it's all it's all novel to me for the time being. So I'm uh, just been trying to like see how far I can tolerate driving in any given direction, or until I hit water, one or the other. That's, and uh, <laughs> in Michigan, that's pretty easy. You're gonna run into water pretty yeah. quick. Yeah. So I I haven't made it to the UP yet. So that's that's on the list. But that's something I kind of want to like. I'd, I'd rather do that with somebody and make kind of a long weekend out of it instead of just kind of wander up there, which is what I've been doing by myself for the most part. So here's a, here's a little fact for you, a little trivia. Uh, anywhere in Michigan, you're never more than I believe 86 miles from a Great Lake. Oh, okay, interesting. Yeah, yeah. There you go. I think that's a great way, <laughs> John, with the trivia. Hey, we'll leave it there. <laughs> if you are in the Midwest, find yourself a Great Lake and have a great weekend. Hope you enjoyed this episode of the Auto Blog Podcast and all things cars. Have a great weekend, enjoy summer, and we'll see you next week.